Good morning. How are you? How's everybody doing today? Good. It's good to be here. Um, God has blessed us with another beautiful day, and uh, we are just we're just happy to, to be here with all of you. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jim Nielsen. I help lead the uh, children's ministry along with Jen Gordy and uh, Amber Swafield. And we're normally up in the uh, upstairs with uh, the kids, but because of the pandemic, we decided that we would have a small service for them down here. And uh, so today's lesson is about Jesus teaching that he was the Messiah. See, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, as everybody knows, but then he, they made their way back to Nazareth where, Beth, where um, Joseph came from. And he's, during that time, he learned about the Bible, and then he started teaching in Nazareth. So I'm gonna play a short video. Um, by the way, our verse for the day is, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that who's, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. John 3.16, it's probably the most popular verse in the whole Bible. Go ahead and play the clip. <clears throat> Jesus went to the town of Nazareth, where he had lived when he was a boy. Now, Jesus has grown. He traveled all around teaching people about God. On the Sabbath day, Jesus went to the synagogue in Nazareth. The synagogue was a special building where Jews met together to pray worship, and learn about the scriptures. Jesus stood up to read scripture. He unrolled the scroll of the prophet Isaiah and read, The Spirit of the Lord is on me. He has chosen me to tell good news to the poor. He has sent me to tell the captives that they are free, to tell the blind that they can see, to free people who have been treated badly, and to announce that the Lord's favor is on us. Then Jesus rolled up the scroll. He gave it to the attendant and sat down. Everyone in the synagogue stared at Jesus. Jesus said, Today, as you listen to me reading these words, they came true. The people said good things about Jesus, and they were amazed at him. Some of the people in Nazareth had known Jesus from his youth. Isn't this Joseph's son? They asked. Jesus said, No prophet is accepted in his own town. Jesus told the people about times when God used prophets to help people who were not Jews. He reminded them of Elijah and Elisha. When there was a terrible famine in Israel and no rain fell there for three and a half years, plenty of widows in the country needed help. But the prophet Elijah did not help the widows in Israel. Instead, God sent Elijah to help a widow in another land. And when Elisha was a prophet, many people in Israel had leprosy. They wanted to be healed, but Elisha did not heal them. Instead, he healed a man named Naaman. Naaman was from Syria, a country that hated God's people. The people in the synagogue were angry. They forced Jesus out of town. They wanted to throw him off a cliff, but Jesus walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Hundreds of years before Jesus the prophet Isaiah wrote about God's plan to send a Messiah. The Messiah would bring good news and redeem people who were broken and hurting. Jesus read Isaiah's words and announced that he is the promised Messiah. Awesome. So as it said in the video, Jesus read these words. He said, today, as you listen, the scripture has been fulfilled. What did Jesus mean? Jesus was saying that those words Isaiah wrote were talking about him. God chose Jesus to preach the good news to the poor, to tell the captives that they are free, and to tell the blind that they can see. God promised throughout the Old Testament that the Messiah would come to rescue, rescue God's people. What makes people special? People are special because we are all made in God's image, as boys and girls, men and women. So, 
if you if kids can remember this verse, um, <clears throat> we have a sign, we have a sheet out there. If they brought their Bible, they can remember this verse, John 3.16, and can recite it. Um, they will get a special, they'll get a, uh, a mark on a sheet that represents a coin, and then every quarter upstairs, when we resume again up there, they will have a chance to purchase some items that uh, with those coins. So if they brought their Bible, they can remember the verse, um, they can remember anything that, um, significant about either Kip's lesson or this lesson, then they'll get a mark. Um, there's also activities, um, plastic bags out there that you can take one with you. If you bring it back next week, filled out, colored and everything, then you can um, you'll get, also get a mark on that sheet. Um, also, if you happen to be especially nice that day, you'll get a mark. <laughs> so, also uh, like us on Pathway, um, yeah, Pathway Kids on Facebook, and um, have a good day. Have a great week. God bless you. There we go. I uh, just want to say a huge thank you to many of you who donated food, some donated cash towards food purchase. We had over 24 families come through here yesterday uh, from the community who had obviously need for food and toiletries. Uh, in the midst of gathering all of that stuff, we have a chance to ask them if there's anything we can be praying for them about. And it's amazing how some people really opened up. And uh, we've seen some of these families now two consecutive months. They're planning on coming back next month. And so just want to say a huge thank you to the church as a whole. Thank you for the men and women, boys and girls that came out and helped serve those people yesterday. Again, you'll have an opportunity to serve if you like on September the 19th. It's always the third Sunday of the month. And mark that on your calendar. You won't be disappointed. It's just a neat opportunity to, to minister to people in the community who've never been here before. And hopefully... Uh, introduce them, more importantly, to Jesus Christ, the Savior who can provide for their greatest need, which is a spiritual need. If you would, let's bow together for a word of prayer before we open up God's Word together this morning. And our Father in Heaven, we love you, and we count it a joy and a privilege to be able to come and to worship you as a church family. And during this uh, odd time in history, Father, we realize that many in our church have yet to come back. Um, but Lord, we thank you for the opportunity we have to gather, to minister to each other through encouragement, through prayer, uh, to lift up our voices in song to you and praise you as a church family, and now to open up your word. May you speak, I pray, through your Holy Spirit to each of us. Meet us where we're at. I pray that this would not just be a mental exercise, but more importantly, Lord, it would be a process in which you transform our hearts into hearts that beat for lost, into hearts that desire to live lives that are right before you and to bring you honor and glory, hearts that are willing to be pliable in your hands, to be transformed into your likeness. We pray to that end. In Jesus' beautiful and precious name I pray. Amen. Amen. When each and every one of us were born, we were welcomed into a home. And within that home, there were individuals who had positions of authority. You call them mom and dad. Mom and dad loved you and cared for you and gave you guidance and direction. They also expected you to live a certain way. So there were times when mom and dad would look at you and say, you need to go clean your room. They weren't making a suggestion. They were instructing you. There were times maybe you sat at the dinner table for long periods of time because you were asked to not leave the table until your vegetables were eaten. Anyone ever experienced that personally? Yeah, those were, liver were the worst meals in my life. It lasted for an eternity, it seemed. But then you got old enough where you went off to school and you were welcomed into a room by a teacher who was an authority in that classroom. There were certain guidelines and behaviors that were expected of you. 
And if you chose to rebel against that, the teacher could have you do different things. And if that didn't work, they sent you to the real disciplinarian, the real authority in the school building known as the principal. And when I was in school, like many of you, they actually had a thing called the paddle. And they weren't afraid to use it. In fact, I was just thinking as we were singing, and it's bad of me to be thinking this, but my elementary school principal would have you come in his office. Now, I'm not speaking from experience. Others told me about this. And they would wad up a piece of paper and drop it on the floor, and as you bent over to pick it up, wha boom! That was an authority. Some of you went on and you played sports. And as you became a, poor, a part of a sports team, you had people known as coaches. And those coaches were not only to teach you how to play the game, but they were also an authority figure. I remember in high school, we had a complex where a junior and senior high were on this big piece of property, the football stadium was off, and then there was this one sole tree that was like forever away. And if you did something wrong, they said, go get me a leaf. And you would have to run up to the tree, snag a leaf, and bring it back to them. That was if you were fortunate. There were other things that could be done. But they were an authority in your life. Each of us live in a community. And in that community, there, there is a government, a local government. And there are rules and regulations, and it's, it's expected that you follow those. And if you don't, there are people that drive around in cars in blue suits or blue uniforms, and they enforce those things. They're there to protect you. They're there to provide justice, seek justice. And we live in a day and age when those people are all getting a bad rap because there are a few bad apples in the group. But we have men within our own congregation who serve on the police force, who are godly men, paid to provide you and I a service, and they're doing a good job of it. Within our country, we have a government, and they're an authority too. We've got people in Washington, D.C. Who are, who are making laws and putting things in place, and those things are things that they expect us to follow. Now, we live in a time in history, unlike any other time I can remember in my lifetime when authority is thought very little of, when people are pushing away and pushing against authority. And the question I wanna throw out to you this morning is what does God's word have to say specifically to those of us who are believers in Jesus Christ and what are we to do when it comes to those in authority over us? We're gonna spend the duration of our time this morning in the book of 1 Peter chapter 2, because our passage this morning as we go through this series entitled Hope for the Hurting is specifically addressing this topic of authority figures in our lives and how we're to respond to those folks. We're in 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 13 down through 17, but before we get there, I think as believers in Jesus Christ, we realize and understand that whatever we do in life, that the bottom line is, as followers of Jesus Christ, we're supposed to bring honor and glory to his name. That we recognize that as believers in Jesus Christ, we are his representatives. We're his representatives in the workplace, in our neighborhoods, in our home, in our churches, in the gym, or whatever other places you may frequent. And as we do that, God's desire is that we would represent him well. Peter, as he's writing to the churches in Asia, he had stated a principle in verses 11 and 12 of chapter 2, and the principle simply was this, that we are to live holy lives as aliens and strangers on this earth. We realize that as Christians, our rightful home church is where? Heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. But while we're here on this earth, we journey towards heaven but in the process, please, please do not lose sight. That doesn't mean that we disregard the authorities here on this earth. That doesn't mean we just punt when it comes to the human government and we disobey them or disregard them. So Peter, he anticipates this conclusion that the believers then, and for that matter, believers now, could potentially reach. Hey, if my citizenship's in heaven, 
Now, why do I have to listen and obey these guys down here? And so he counters that thought process by showing the Christian citizens how we are to live. He says, Christians are to live as good citizens, how? By submitting to human government. Look with me, if you would, at verses 13 through 15. Submit yourselves to the Lord uh, for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority, or the governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. The first thing Peter points out is that we as believers in Jesus Christ are to submit to our government leaders. As soon as I say that, you guys realize the word submit is not necessarily a real popular favorite word for most people. If I was to give it a one word definition, it would be obey. But I, I don't want to just leave it there because this is a word that Peter seems to have as a favorite. He uses it some six times in this letter alone, this short letter of First Peter. This word submit is a military term and it means to place oneself under another in rank. If you ever served in the military, you understood that there were officers above you. You submitted to them. And it's that concept. Submission is an attitude that you and I have of respect that results in our obedience. Three thoughts as it relates to this idea of you and I submitting to our government. First of all, as Christians, submission means obedience to the laws of the state. Unless, of course, the laws are laws that are requiring for you and I to disobey God. So one of the things we can understand is that as believers, we're responsible to obey the law. What does that mean? Well, we're responsible to pay taxes. We're responsible, get this, to comply with traffic laws. I was in a discussion not too long ago, and I'm not going to break confidence. It doesn't matter who it was with. But we were talking about this whole idea of the speed limit. There are those who will never exceed the speed limit by even one mile per hour. And there are others who take a little bit of liberty because they say, you can go up to 10 miles an hour past the speed limit. And it's okay, it'll let you go. You just want to go beyond that. So is that complying with the law? Or are we taking a little liberty, a little freedom? I'm not here to point fingers at anybody. I gotta deal with my own stuff, just like you do. So we need to comply with the laws. There's a second part to this idea of submitting to our local gov or our government leaders, and that's it. Submission also means showing respect for government or to government authorities. Peter says that we are to honor all men, and in verse 17 specifically, he says, we're to honor the king. But you might ask, what if the king, or in our case, what if the government official in that position is just a bad nut? What if they're just really a lousy person? What if they're a person with no integrity, no character? What if they're a person who is immoral? What if they're a person who is anything but responsible? What if they're corrupt? What then? Well, I believe what we're being told here is even if we can't respect the individual, that we are to respect the office. Because the office is something that God put in place. We laugh oftentimes at political jokes. We see caricatures of many of our political figures. Uh, they're made to look like a bunch of buffoons or idiots. And we laugh. But the reality is, there are people that we are to respect as political officials. Why? Because God ordained them, the government authority. And if we're going to despise such authority, the reality is, in essence, we're despising God. There's a third component when it comes to our submitting to government leaders, and that's this, that it means, submission means positive good deeds. Notice what he says in verse 15. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. 
Peter isn't referring to government leaders when he's talking about foolish men here. He instead is referring to the ignorant people who are slandering Christians as evildoers. He had made mention of that earlier in verse 12. But when we come here to verse 15, he, he refers to silencing them. And that word silence literally means to muzzle. To muzzle. You have a dog. There are times where you put a muzzle on that dog, maybe when you take it to the dog clinic. There are times maybe where the dog's out of control at home and to quiet it down a little bit, you muzzle it. You silence it. And the idea is that by our active good deeds, when you and I live for the Lord Jesus Christ in such a way that is honoring to him, in the process, all the, the criticisms that would be conjured up and directed toward us are removed because there's no basis for that. So our relationship as Christians to the state and to state officials is quite clear. In the book of Timothy Paul is writing to Timothy, and in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, listen to what Paul says to Timothy. He said, I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people. For who, church? For kings and all those in authority. That they may live peacefully and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. As Paul's writing, he's instructing his young Timothy, hey, we need to be praying for everybody, he says. We need to be praying for the unsaved as well as the saved. We need to be praying for our friends as well as our enemies. We need to be praying for those close to us and those who are far from us. Please understand, who are, to, who are we to be praying for? Everybody, including and especially those in authority. Why, when we have prayer time, we pray for our country, but we pray for the leadership of our country. Why? Because we're directed biblically to do so. I was cutting my grass this week thinking about that. And thinking how often, how often are the political figures and authorities in my life people that I typically pray for? It's not something I just do on a Sunday morning. I should daily pray for them. They need it. They have an incredibly difficult task. I would not want what they do for a living. But I, as a believer in Jesus Christ, have a responsibility, and that is to lift them up in prayer. And here Paul's urging the church to especially pray for those in authority. Now keep in mind that as Paul's writing this, who it is that's in that role as the authority in his life, it was the godless emperor Nero who was on the throne at the time. Paul saying, yeah, pray for him too. I know the guy's a kook. He's literally nuts. He hates Christians. He has it in for Christians. He physically torched Christian bodies to light his courtyards. So when I say he's a nut, I'm not making it up. He's truly a nut. Paul says, yeah. You even pray for him. You might not be able to respect the man or the woman in that position, but please, by all means, respect the office they hold. And because they hold that office, you pray for them. You lift them up before the throne of God. And then later, Paul writes to Titus, and in Titus chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, he says, Remind the people to be subject to the rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always to be gentle toward everyone. When we as Christians take these verses to heart, and when we live our lives out that way, something incredible happens before a pagan world that we live in. They see the powerful testimony of a life lived for Jesus Christ, empowered by him through the Holy Spirit who resides in the life of a believer. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> On the other hand, when we who profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we punt and we don't do those things, then we leave a bad taste in the mouth of those critics out there around us. 
So Peter's first word of advice and direction to these believers in Asia in our passage this morning is this. Submit to the government authorities that God has placed there. Secondly, he provides for us the purpose of the government. We're given the purpose for the government. Notice verse 14 of this chapter. Or to the governors who sent by him, who are sent by him, notice, to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. Peter is reminding his readers here that the government has a very valid and necessary God-appointed purpose. And here it is, verse 14. To punish the evildoers and to praise those who do right. <clears throat> they're there to provide justice and peace. That's what they're there for. And even though there's political corruption, and we know there is, we see it on the headlines of the news. It's not always the case, but it exists. But it should not blind you and I to the fact that the role they play is a legitimate, God-given, God-ordained purpose. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Peter then provides us with the reason why we submit to the government. Notice what he says in the first part of verse 13. Submit yourselves, and I want you to read this next part with me, for the Lord's sake. Two thoughts about that phrase. First of all, we submit for the Lord's sake to the governing authorities in our lives. Why? First of all, since God has ordained those in authority over us, which we know to be the government officials, that as we submit to them, in reality, we are submitting first and foremost to God. That's why we do it. Find it elsewhere in the book of Ephesians chapter 5 when we're talking about the roles of a husband and wife. Wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. You do it out of obedience to Christ. We submit to those in authority over us out of obedience to God. Paul clearly states for us in the book of Romans, chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. He says, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which, who has established? God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. It makes it abundantly clear, does it not? So, keep in mind that as, as Peter and Paul are writing in these different letters, that we have this deranged man that I referred to earlier as Nero, who is the emperor on the throne. When we go in the Old Testament, we see Daniel taken captive, and Daniel is under the leadership of a ruthless king by the name of King Nebuchadnezzar. When you stop and you think about Nero in the New Testament, you think about Nebuchadnezzar, there's so many more we could pull out from Scripture. But the reality was, these guys both lived at a time where the rulers that they were under the authority of fell far, far short of the ideal. But what we conclude is this, that the biblical principle of our obedience to the government authority is not something that you and I can sidestep in any way, shape, or form because of how bad the ruler may be. The principles of God's word don't change. We take it to heart. Peter knew his readers. He knew that they would not naturally gravitate towards the idea of being submissive before a pagan ruler. And so look at what he writes in verse 16 of chapter 2. He said, live as free people and do not use your freedom as a cover up for evil. Live as God's slaves. True freedom in the life of a believer is when you and I choose to live a righteous life in submission to God first and foremost. So when it comes to you and I submitting to those in authority, we're to do it for the Lord's sake. But there's a second thought about that I wanted to share with you, and that's this. Since we as Christians are identified with God, our submission to the governing authorities over us 
in reality bears witness of the reality of God in our lives. This theme of you and I as followers of Jesus Christ, being witnesses for him as we journey through this life on this earth until the Lord either returns for us or calls us home, is a theme in which we as aliens living in a hostile world are to be witnesses, and it's from chapter 2, verse 12, carried all the way through the end of chapter 3, and we're going to be looking at that in the weeks to come. So as we journey through life, as we live lives of righteousness before God and obedience to God's word, what happens is as we do that, we're fulfilling God's will for us and for our lives. As we do that, we are truly servants of God. And in reality, how we live our lives are being lived for the Lord's sake. A true Christian is one who submits himself or herself to authority, no, because he or she is first of all submitted to Christ. And as those submitted to Christ, then we use the God-given freedoms that we have as a tool to build up others, not as a weapon to fight with others. <clears throat> Well, Paul then segues to the last part of our passage this morning. He did believe that there were times where you and I submitting to those in authority may not be necessarily what we ought to do. And I'm not speaking out of both sides of my mouth, so just hear me out here. There are times when those in authority, as you read through the Old and New Testament, would ask the followers of God to do something that would contradict what God asked of them. Or I could put it this way, where they were asked to obey them in doing something, but if they were to obey it, they would then be sinning before God. Or as I put in my outline, obey except when commanded to sin. Look at verse 17 if you would. And I want you to specifically look at the last two phrases. Show proper respect to everyone, love the family of believers, fear God, honor the emperor. Peter here makes a, a distinction between God and those in authority here on this earth. Here's the distinction. We're to fear God, we're to honor kings. Why? While a king is in a position, or a government official, or an authority here on earth now, is in a position that we're supposed to submit to. Remember this. The individual has been created by their creator. God, on the other hand, is the creator. He's far, far greater. And so he's making a very clear distinction here. There are times, however, when our human governments may ask you and I to do something that would not sit well, would trouble our conscience because we knew that what they were asking us to do flew in the very face of what God's instructed us to do. Let me just point out a couple of biblical situations to drive that home. I think that there are places in the world where people are forbidden to worship God. They're asked to worship either the God that communism is placed in place, or maybe Muslim or Hindu is the, the faith of that area, and if you become a Christian, don't take your life in many cases. But if you were asked point blank, stop following Jesus Christ, stop worshiping him, and instead we want you to worship this God over here, this idol over here, what would you do? Well, in the book of Daniel, that's the exact situation that these three young men found themselves, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. King Nebuchadnezzar had erected a large golden statue of himself. Uh, he had been encouraged by others, hey, have everyone worship you and only you, and if they don't, there's going to be a serious consequence. We're going to throw them into a fiery furnace. Kill them. And so we, we turn to the book of Daniel in chapter 3. And here's what was heralded to all the people. This is what you are commanded to do. All, all peoples, nations, and men of every language. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, and pipes, and all kinds of music, you must 
fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Word gets out that there are some who aren't following the instructions that have been given. They're told, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they pay no attention to what you've said. We're told in verse 13 of chapter 3 that Nebuchadnezzar was furious with rage, and so he summoned the three to come before him. And again, he said, hey, listen, when you hear the music, just drop down, we'll be good. But I want you to listen to the words that follow. But if you do not worship it, you'll be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. And you know the story. He was so, so angry over their response that he gave instruction for that furnace to be heated up seven times hotter. And these men took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these guards. And the guards that threw them into the furnace, they were killed on the spot because of the heat. But you're Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the furnace. And those outside looking in said, wait, wait, wait a minute. Then we throw three in there? There's four. It looks like the Son of God. You know the story. They're asked to come out. They're unscathed. Perfectly fine. Now let me ask, or let me just share this with you. There may be times we take a stand because what they're asking of us flies in the face of our obedience to God. That's always the right decision for us as followers of Jesus Christ, to follow what God says. But there could be consequences, just like there were for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I think in the New Testament of the apostles in the book of Acts, Peter and John, I believe it was, or Peter and Paul, in Acts chapter 3, had healed the crippled beggar. It was Peter and John. Because of this incredible miracle, people are coming and are listening to what Peter and John are saying. Popularity is growing. The gospel is being heard and spreading. Well, you can imagine the religious leaders we're not happy about this. They're quite upset. And so they bring in Peter and John. And they tell Peter and John, and you got to love these religious leaders. They wouldn't mention the name of Jesus, but this is what they told them. Stop this thing from spreading any further among the people. You must warn these men to speak no longer to anyone in this name. They wouldn't even say the name. So they bring John and Peter in before the Sanhedrin, which would have been the equivalent of the Jewish Supreme Court. There's 71 people on this Sanhedrin group. And this is what they said. Then they called them in again, and they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Listen to Peter and John's reply. Judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Remember, what makes an apostle an apostle is they were eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ. They saw Jesus Christ and walked with Jesus Christ prior to his death. They watched him crucify, and then they spoke with him, ate with him, sat with him following his resurrection. You're going to tell me I can't talk about what I know to be true? You want me to follow what you're asking me to do, and it flies in the face? and contradicts what God's instructing me to do, that's not going to happen. So they go out and they continue doing what they've been doing, preaching about Jesus Christ, the gospel. The religious leaders, once again, are not happy at all. And so they ask for the apostles to be brought back in again. Chapter 5, verse 29, Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. 
Church, there may be times when you and I are going to be presented with a situation we're going to have to make a choice. Do I give in to the pressure of what man says? If it flies in the face of what God's telling me to do? And at that point, we want to always err on the side of honoring God and obeying God and not man. As Peter's writing about authority in our life, let's understand that we are to submit to those in authority over us. Let's also understand that they serve a very distinct and valid purpose. Let's understand that as you and I go about submitting to them, we submit to them, number one, because we want to honor God first and foremost, and in the process be a great witness for him before others. And then lastly, there may very well come a time when we have to make a tough decision. And that decision, that decision is to follow after God even though we're being pressured to do otherwise. Not saying it's easy, church. We have been blessed in this country. We have tremendous freedom in this country. But I'm not naive enough to think that that will always be the case. And I think it's absolutely critical now that we make that decision. If and when that time comes, I choose to follow after God and obey Him above all else. If you would, just bow with me for a moment. This letter written to the churches in Asia Minor a long time ago. How applicable, practical, how fitting for the day and age in which we live. It's timeless. Lord, I thank you for the word of God. I thank you that it is always relevant. Father, I pray that as your children, our lives would be lived in such a way where we would submit to those that you put in places of authority. That, Father, we would strive to honor you and to be an incredible witness before others of the reality that Jesus Christ is alive and well in us. And if and when those times come where we have to make that decision, Father, that we've already made that decision and choice now. So when that time comes, we already know what our decision is going to be. Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for the men and women, boys and girls, that make up this church. And I pray that as we leave this place today, that we would go into a world that desperately needs you. And that we would live our lives in such a way where Jesus Christ would be seen in us. May many come to know you. And I thank you that we don't save a soul, but you include us in that process of rubbing shoulders and crossing paths with men and women who are deeply, deeply in need of you. Help us to model for them what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And when they ask and inquire about it, may we not be ashamed, but boldly declare, that's not us, but it's Jesus Christ in us. Lord, may you, I pray, have your way in our lives. May our lives be lived in such a way that truly you receive glory and honor, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.